Alexander was said to have admired Diogenes of Sinop above anyone else and said, if I wasn't Alexander the Great, I wish I was Diogenes of Sinop, okay? A homeless beggar in the streets of Athens. And there's all these stories about their interaction. So supposedly Alexander went up, introduced himself to him and said, I'm Alexander the Great, and Diogenes said, I'm Diogenes the dog, uh, back to him. And the best story, which is in section 38, about how Alexander says, um, make any request of me. He's, he's, he's standing over him while Diogenes is, is sitting somewhere in the streets, sunning himself, and Alexander says, make any request of me. I'll grant any request that you have. So great is his admiration for him. And Diogenes says, step out of my sun. Right, to the, to the most powerful emperor who's conquering all the world and so forth. And there is sort of a, a double meaning there. Step out of my sun because I'm sunbathing and I make a trivial request of this great man. But it's also step out of my sun, meaning why is fame and glory being attached to somebody who's off causing global misery and chaos and so forth, as opposed to the attention being put on someone who's rejected all of this earthly stuff and yet manifests moral virtues of wisdom and courage. That's what the spotlight should be focused on, not, not on this military, uh, these military victories and so forth. And there are other stories about their interaction. Now, <clears throat> those seem to be true. Alexander the Great was somebody who we know had a philosophical education. He'd been tutored by Aristotle of Stagira. Um, and he took an interest in philosophy. And Diogenes was a well-known, in fact, famous figure around town. So Alexander did probably actually interact with him, but these are probably made-up Hellenistic biographical stories for amusement about there interactions. Although by all indications, Diogenes was a witty guy who could always have a comeback, and he's sort of got a Socrates-like thing like that, not claiming to teach people things, but he's always got the upper hand in a, in a conversation. Okay? Uh, so that's his interaction with Alexander the Great, a political figure. There's also his interactions with Plato. So you, you notice a lot of anecdotes about him interacting with Plato, and he's treading on Plato's carpets with his bare feet and so forth. And, and, he, and, and, a lot, and in a lot of these, Plato actually gets the upper hand on him. So he says, I tread on, on the pride of Plato with his carpets or something. And Plato responds, yes, with an even greater and ig more ignorant pride or something like that. Um, and a really funny one depicted in this uh, painting is that in the academy they're having an obstruse debate about the definition and classification of various animals, and they're coming up with a definition of human being, something like a two-footed land animal, um, you know, a two-footed animal, but some birds, birds are obviously animals, and birds have two Feet, so we have to define them as being featherless, bipedal animals. And so they come up with this definition, featherless biped, for what a human being is. And then supposedly Diogenes plucked the feathers off of a chicken and brought it into the academy and said, I give you Plato's human being. <laughs> um, and Aristotle called Diogenes a Socrates gone mad. So... Um, that shows his intellectual level interactions, whereas the stories about his interactions with Alexander the Great show his political interactions. And so before class, we were talking about uh, Hellenistic politics and how they relate to ethics in general. And these kind of stories show that there still was political engagement, and even people sort of speaking truth to power and that, that sort of thing even even in a dangerous political climate. Although by the time that Alexander the Great was ascendant, pol political situation in Athens had changed vastly from the democratic situation that Socrates was in. 
Okay, other, uh, other questions or just things that struck you about the reading? We can, we can focus on those. I mean, I basically picked out ones that I thought were interesting, but I'd, l I'd love to hear what occurred to you as you were reading it. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, don't know that how come on the part of Socrates uh, there is no any mentioning about the paradigm of the philosophy of Plato that has been under the influence of Socrates, like, for example, the reality, the form, uh, this is the paradigm of the, of the Plato philosophy which have been most probably taken from Socrates, but didn't talk about this part on, on Socrates well, in this paper. Well, it's not clear to me that Plato's theory of forms, mm -hmm. a logical and metaphysical theory, is attributable to Socrates. In fact, most scholars think it isn't. Socrates talked about things like the unity of virtues and virtues being forms of knowledge and trying to come up with definitions of the individu individual virtues. But did he construct a metaphysical system that accounts for all of nature and <coughs> these ethical values and so forth? Probably not, because we have a lot of testimony that Socrates rejected those kind of logical and physical inquiries to focus only on ethics. Now, Plato clearly does get into these metaphysical issues and, and physics and logic and that sort of thing. And he uses Socrates as a character even in dialogues like the sophist or the statesman where they go in for these logical and in the timaeus with the natural philosophy and so forth. But it's, um, but that's probably Plato's views being put into the mouth of Socrates instead of Socrates' views. Now, Plato, in a way, is a paradigm for Hellenistic philosophy, but he's beyond a paradigm. He's a founder of a school that actually persists into, into the period. So he's more like Epicurus or, or um, Zeno of Kidium, or somebody who actually established an institution, an institution that went on for a thousand years, the first institution of higher education that lasted that long, and so on. So... Um, I'm not trying to slight Plato, and in fact, we're going to get into academic skepticism and various forms of academicism, and the work that we're reading by Cicero, Cicero considers himself an academic, following in, the, in, in line with Socrates and Plato, so we're reading an entire work over, over four weeks of somebody continuing that line of thought into the, into the Hellenistic age. As for, you know, the specific problems with the theory of forms, we're not going to deal too much with that because we'd have to read a lot of Plato, so we'd have to read a lot of classical as opposed to Hellenistic philosophy to figure out what that theory is. But we do offer an entire course on Plato where we, where we do that. Okay, other questions, comments? Yeah. Um, to return to Diogenes, in section 22 in Diogenes Flourishes, it mentions that he uh, was a student of Antisthenes, but um, what were Antisthenes' uh, philosophical, philosophical views? How did those influence um, Diogenes? Yes, so as I mentioned last time, Antisthenes was a member of the Socratic circle, so he was a direct pupil of Socrates, okay? And he ended up doing his own teaching, setting up teaching in a gymnasium called the Kuno Sarges, which is named after the so-called white dog. And some people think that the whole name of cynicism stems from this, because to, to be a cynic means to be a dog. Kunos in Greek means, means uh, dog. Um, but his views were basically an extremely austere and ascetic kind of philosophy, that you had to... Um, get rid of your possessions, get rid of wealth, and focus everything on being a good person. And anything that could distract from that, or detract from it, or lead you down a different road, you should completely reject because none of it's important. So he puts massive emphasis on virtue, self-control, courage, justice, things like that. And he also seems to have been one of the earliest pe per people 
maybe the earliest to use this idea that the, the, the main ethical principle is to live in accordance with nature and live naturally and not be corrupted by artifices uh, of society. And so he had this reputation for being a tough, austere, ascetic philosopher, <coughs> totally devoted to virtue. And when Diogenes of Sinope was exiled from his own city and arrived in Athens, he heard about this guy and looked him up and started following him around saying, I want to be your pupil. And Antisthenes rejected him as a pupil and said, I don't ha I'm not going to teach you. And according to the story in Diogenes Laertius, even tried to beat him away with a stick as depicted in this medieval uh, manuscript, but Diogenes just took it and said, go ahead, keep beating me, I'm still going to be your student. And then so eventually he took him on uh, as, as a student. And so Antisthenes wasn't really called a cynic and didn't take on this, this persona, so we think of him as sort of a proto-cynic, whereas Diogenes of Sinope, who did call him, allow people to call, people would insult him by calling him a dog, and he'd say, yes, exactly, I'm a dog. Dogs are a lot better than human beings. Are you kidding me? Um, then that starts cynicism, and then there's a whole school of people that start following that lifestyle and so forth. But we, we can almost trace it back to an interpretation of Socrates' teachings. Now, as we're going to see on Friday, we, there's another interpretation of Socrates' teaching that lends itself to hedonistic philosophy, pursuit of pleasure, forget about virtue, and things like that, which just shows, in a way, the ambivalence of what Socrates actually said. He didn't write anything, he just had individual conversations, and people took very different things away from it. But Antisthenes is one extreme of what you could take away from Socrates to say, throw everything else away, and to devote yourself to philosophy. Um, while I'm at it, I should mention some things about Diogenes, about, about other people in this cynic movement. After Diogenes, Diogenes takes on a student named Crates of Thebes, who ends up married to a woman named Hipparchia of Maronea, who's a female philosopher, very early female Hellenistic philosopher, and they continued this live in accordance with nature and throw off all social conventions. So just as Diogenes had um, ate and slept and relieved himself and even masturbated in public, because why not? I'm living in accordance with nature. Those are just social conventions you're trying to impose on me to stop it. They even went further and just started having sex in public. Um, and saying, hey, this is natural. We all do this. We need to do this. We can make the species survive. You know, you're living an unnatural life by having all of this, you know, wearing all these clothes and, and uh, having all these restrictions on, on following life in accordance with nature. And there are other more minor Greek cynics after that, including some whose writings survive. Um, and then in the Roman period, it seems to have been re revived a bit after the time of Cicero, but by the first century AD, and continued as a strong sort of second cynical movement that lasted until about the fifth century AD. Now, there's also an interpretation of Jesus as having been a cynic. If you ask what was Jesus's uh, philosophy, this guy who embraced poverty, rejected the conventions of his time, taught a kind of cosmopolitan doctrine about being a citizen of the world, focused on being good uh, and everything on morality and virtue and so forth. Um, you know, what kind of ideas are thought to have influenced him? So there are scholars that have written that essentially he was, he was embracing a cynic philosophy and lifestyle and making himself as an example um, as a cynic. Um, so that's just a bit about, about um, the later influence of the movement. Okay, and how it relates back to Antisthenes, somebody in the Socratic circle. Okay, other, other questions? Yeah? Go ahead. I was wondering if you could go in more to where um, he lit the lamp in the daylight. <laughs> 
one round searching for a person? Yes, and I think I've got some some very crazy uh, artistic drawings of this one. So here is here's a depiction of Diogenes the Cynic walking through the streets of Athens in broad daylight carrying a lit lantern. And people saying to him, why are you carrying a lit lantern in, the middle, in, in broad daylight? And he says, because I'm searching for an honest human being. Um, and he's not, he's not finding one. Now, one, one interpretation of that that is depicted in this early modern piece of artwork is that he's in a depraved and cynical society where the people have devolved and they're not even human beings. You have this, these monstrous saber-like figures and then sculptures of humans and other kinds of animals and so forth, but he, he can't actually find somebody who's living a human way of life. Um, more recently, interpretation of this, and, and, and something similar is in this famous piece of art, there's Diogenes in the center with his lantern looking for an honest human being, or uh, looking for a genuine human being, somebody who's actually human. Um, what it actually seems to have related to is a debate about human nature and what really is a human being. A human is not just a featherless biped, right? Having two feet and dwelling on land is not enough to make you a human. Okay, so what is it that makes you a human? Well, something to do with reason and rationality and using the mind, because that's what makes us different from, from animals and plants as, as living things. Well, what does it mean to use reason? Well. In Diogenes' view, it means living in accordance with nature, figuring out what nature is and then living in accordance with it, and in accordance with these moral virtues, like justice, courage, and so forth. But you could walk around the streets of Athens and find that no one you're running into is courageous, just, or anything. You've just got a bunch of self-absorbed people on their cell phones and so forth that don't care anything about uh, virtue, and so you can't find a single genuine human being according to your, according to the definition of what a human being is that you come up with. So, um, again, it's in part just his kind of political theater, you know, walking around with a lit lantern, people wondering what the hell are you, what the hell are you doing, and, um, uh, but it seems to be making a philosophical point, a criticism of everyone around him, a criticism of the society around him, but also a deep question about what is truly human, what the nature of human beings is. Okay, any other thoughts about that or anything else here? Anyone? Go ahead. Is that where Nietzsche took the episode of Yes, that is where all of these images of lanterns being used in art and in literature go back to Diogenes. Every one of these pictures you'll see, he has a lantern in it. That's how you know you're looking at a representation of Diogenes. Um, and Nietzsche said something like, there is, there is no truer philosophy than cynicism, which Given that it's Nietzsche, you don't, he doesn't think any philosophies are true, so what does that really amount to? But he says something like that. It says positive things about um, cynics. And he tries to do on a literary level what they tried to do in actual, you know, as actual people. Now, one, one more thing when I was talking about the influence on this slide that I didn't talk about, because I will much later, his influence on Stoicism and the cynic influence on Stoicism. And we really see this in later Stoics like Epictetus and so forth, who hold Diogenes of Sinop as equal to Socrates and, and, and as being a sage, somebody who actually knew the difference between good and bad and knew what true human success was and lived in accordance with it. And the Stoic system sort of builds itself on top of cynicism and begins to present itself as, well, there's basically two routes to happiness, the short route and the long and difficult route. And the long and difficult route 
is to study Stoic logic and physics and figure this whole system out and start living in accordance with it and trying to make moral progress and so forth. The shortcut is to be a cynic, to take all of your money and go down to La Jolla on the shores and throw it into the ocean and start just walking around, living on the streets and talking to people about virtue and trying to convince them to become virtuous people and getting rid of all of your possessions and all of your desires and all of your connections to your immediate family and things like that that could be sources of corruption or sources of value other than living in accordance with nature. And that's really a shortcut to virtue and doing the right thing. And, that's, and, and Stoics thought, that's just too hard for most people, though. They can't do that. So we've got to design this other system that has them learning propositional logic and physics and so forth, and then you can show them how to live, but um, otherwise not. Uh, uh, otherwise it's impossible. Um, or, or, or it's, only, it's only possible through this difficult philosophical school and philosophical training that takes decades and may not actually ever be successful. But there is a, there is a shortcut to doing it, and that's cynicism. Living, living the life of a cynic. Now, I mean, I think this is a really interesting idea because there's a lot about cynicism that we, you might see reflected around us. And, and even the term cynicism, which is still in use, although it has a much different meaning, it seems to now mean something like people who doubt human sincerity and they have a you know, pessimistic view and they're, they're motivated not by noble concerns but by, only by their self-interest and what works for them. That, that is what is now thought when we say cynics, when we say, you know, Steve Bannon is a very cynical individual. We don't mean he's living a life like Diogenes of Sinop, okay? So the meaning of it has become twisted around quite a bit. So to mean just people who offend and throw off, alter the currency and, and uh, deface the current standards and criticize the way people are living without thinking of the deep philosophical basis and thought uh, behind that. Okay, other other thoughts about this? Yeah. So, like, the short wrap you're saying, like, um, so asceticism kind of cultivates virtue for them? Yes. So, one thing you want to do is cut off... So, the idea is that our nature is actually good. And if we lived according to our human nature, that we would be happy. And the animals don't have any choice. They all live according to their own nature, and so they don't have their, the kinds of misery and depression and, and so on that we do, because they just live according to their nature and there's no other way to be. We, however, because of the kind of minds we have, can confuse ourselves and can develop habits and um, ways of acting that actually uh, make us miserable and make us um, have large desires and addictions for things that, that make us miserable. And so in this view, what you need to do is throw off all sources of those things. Now, with respect to desire, this is really interesting because there's, there's a couple of ways of dealing with desire. Like if you have a desire for a new car or a new house or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or something like that. There's two ways to deal with it. One is to satisfy that desire, to actually earn the money or whatever by the car or the house or earn that person's affection or whatever. Another way is just to eliminate the desire. Stop desiring those things, right? And in Diogenes' view, the latter strategy makes way more sense and is way more satisfying and in accordance with our nature. Because nothing in our nature says we have to drive sports cars or we have to sleep with the most beautiful people or anything. In fact, those are totally unnatural things that we've gotten from advertising and that sort of thing. They, aren't, they, aren't, they don't really have anything to do with what human nature is. So, but how are you going to get rid of those desires? How are you going to throw off those influences? Well, the first thing, instead of throwing money into the ocean now, like Crates did, the, the starting point would be throwing your cell phone into the ocean and saying, first of all, I'm cutting off all of that source of artificiality 
in, in my life. But of course, if you don't have a cell phone, you can't function. You can't have a job. You can't practically go to school or anything, right? So now, now you now you have to um, you you can't rent an apartment, right? So you embrace homelessness. Okay. Now some people, I, I presume the majority of homeless people are homeless not because it's their choice, but because, like, you can't hardly afford to live in the city even if you're rich, okay? And so they don't, they would like to have homes, but they don't have homes. But some of them don't want to live in a house. And Diogenes didn't want to live in a house, because it's really, um, you take on a lot of burdens when you own a house, or even are willing to live in one, even rent one, or even couch surfing even has a lot of burdens. Like, you have to do the dishes when the, when the other people whose house you live in come by, or they, they make you wake up at a certain time and, uh, and get out of the house for a while, or something like that. Whereas, um, you know, much less taking on mortgages and debt and so forth in, in order to own houses. So one way to deal with wanting to have, um, have some shelter is to devote your life to having to do massive amounts of work, entering into contracts, dealing with real estate agents, attorneys, renters, landlords, things like that. Another way is just to say, forget all of that. I'm just not going to deal with any of that and just, and just live without a home. And so I think some people, this, this is another interesting thing about cynicism, I think some people are still living according to a cynic philosophy. They don't have bank accounts. They don't, they don't own property, they don't even own their own bicycle, they just hotwire these rental ones that are all over the place, or just piece their own together, uh, because you don't want the attachments, you don't want all of those responsibilities, and you can't live how you want to. If what you value most of all is, is your freedom, you might think, God, that's not a free way of life, they can't do what they want, but they don't want to have all of these restrictions and rent deadlines and conforming to all these requirements. Just forget it. Live in the streets. Yeah? Um, is it in accordance with the idea of living in tranquility or if one's further or more difficult? Yes, so he, he would argue to the end that this is a far more tranquil way of life. These, these people trying to make their mortgage payments and deal with landlords and so forth. Uh, way more, it, it, it basically ruins the possibility that you could be a tranquil person, because you have to worry about that all the time. Whereas he says, you know, he'll, he'll sleep on the stairs of a temple, and so he says, oh, here's the temple dedicated to Zeus. What a nice house the Athenians have built me here. And so he, he lives in, in these temples devoted to the gods, or he lives in a giant... Uh, earthenware tub or a, or a jar that's used for storing things that happens to be empty. Um, in other words, like living under the I-5 freeway or something. What a wonderful house the San Diegans have built me right here. Why would I go out and take on a mortgage? Okay, so um, yes, you'd absolutely say that it's, it, it's the shortcut to tranquility. There is this longer term thing, but you might not be smart enough to follow it, and you, or you might not have enough time. You might die before you figure out how to live a virtuous life that way. But you want, you want tranquility. Get rid of all of those ambitions about being a high-powered attorney or a successful scientist or whatever. Just, just throw those away and just live according to nature. And, and the closer you get back to nature, you'll find that that's where the true source of tranquility and happiness is for a human being. Um, it's your natural state that you would be in if you weren't torturing yourself with unnatural stuff, with, me with mere conventions of society. Okay. Excuse me. John yeah. Jacques Rousseau also raised the same opinion, doesn't he? Well, um, you keep asking these questions and the answer to it is one would need to read thousands of pages of Rousseau in order to answer that, and we haven't read any Rousseau in here. So how can I, how can I say that? Now he has a view. Rousseau has a well-known view that um, essentially we should live natural, we should live 
naturally and that even our system of education and so forth imposes artifices on us that make us miserable. And in that sense, it is a cynic-like view and does show the continuing influence of cynicism.